Welcome to Our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to Our Curious Amalgam. I'm Alicia Downey, and the title of today's episode is... Who is Aviva Will, antitrust lawyer and litigation financing entrepreneur? Litigation financing is a relatively new part of the legal ecosystem, and one that is still unfamiliar to many lawyers and the general public, both in and outside the United States. What makes the topic relevant to a podcast that's all about antitrust and competition law is that private antitrust litigation is expensive for both sides. It can involve multiple parties, complex facts, and numerous issues that require teams of expensive economists and lawyers to analyze. We're talking today with someone who has been working in the center of it all as the COO of a major global litigation finance company. We'll hear about her interesting career path and about what's happening in the world of antitrust litigation and who's paying for it all. My co-host today is Matthew Hall. Hello, Matthew. Hi, Alicia. Would you like to introduce our guest and kick off the conversation? Thank you. As indicated in the title, our guest today is Aviva Will. Aviva is co-chief operating officer of Burford Capital, a publicly traded global litigation finance and asset management company. Before joining Burford in New York in 2010, Aviva was a senior litigation manager and assistant general counsel at Time Warner Inc., where she served as the company's leading antitrust and regulatory counsel, advising senior management on antitrust risk and overseeing all government antitrust investigations and merger clearances. After a post-law school clerkship on the New Jersey Supreme Court, Aviva spent the first five years of her career as a litigator at law firm Cravath, Swain and Moore. Welcome to our curious amalgam, Aviva. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, thank you for coming on. You've obviously had a very interesting career journey to date. Could you just take us through and briefly how you went from being a lawyer to a senior executive at a publicly traded litigation finance company in Burford? So I'd like to think there was a master plan, but but of course there wasn't. It was a fair bit of luck and a bit of hard work. The short version is I was sitting at my desk as an in-house lawyer at Time Warner, where I was perfectly happy doing antitrust work. And a former colleague of mine from Cravath called me and said, I've just raised $135 million on the London Stock Exchange, and I'm going to do this thing called litigation finance. And gee, wouldn't it be fun to come do it with me? And I've always been a bit of a risk taker, and I've always been curious. And I did a little bit of homework, and I thought, well, hmm, that's a pretty interesting idea. Obviously, there wasn't much of it around. And, and so I was sort of like the idea of trying to create something from scratch. The transformation from entrepreneur at a six-person startup to what is today a, a multi-billion dollar global organization, that was you know a 15-year evolution, I would say, of learning new things and figuring out how to run a business and how to develop a business and how to, how to, how to sort of do everything from figure out on, on day one how to get my new computer because I wasn't any anyway in any shape part of a, a larger organization to now sort of figuring out how to run a 160 plus person business across you know multiple jurisdictions it's been really a lot of fun frankly yeah an amazing jump from as you know big law to a small startup and now to a larger business burford as we've intimated funds commercial litigation and arbitration activity by companies and also law firms in the US and around the world which are the principal claim areas that Burford is dealing with at the moment? You know, generally we deal with business disputes between, you know, two businesses and in some instances governments, but, but generally business disputes of all flavors. So any kind of business dispute from contract, fraud, securities, antitrust, insolvency, intellectual property, you name it, sort of general business disputes that parties have. We also fund investor state arbitrations. Those are uh, arbitrations subject to state treaties between governments. 
so when a country changes its law or otherwise, you know, deprives a company of its investment in a in that country, whether that's a mine or an airport or real, real estate development, those cases are cases that are long and by their nature quite expensive. And so they lend themselves well to funding. And we do a fair bit of that as well. So the, the ABA section of antitrust law focuses on antitrust, competition, consumer protection, privacy and data protection. Are you covering claims in each of those areas? We do a fair bit of antitrust work, and that that portfolio is very diversified across jurisdictions, across you know areas of industry. We do some data privacy, not a whole lot. Those cases tend to be very important, but smaller in nature in terms of damages, although we're seeing more and more globally that that's becoming more prevalent and those cases are growing. Because of our scale, we tend not to do smaller investments. Uh, Burford put out more than a a billion dollars in new commitments in the last couple of years each year. And so you can imagine that to scale at that size, we have to make big investments. So they tend to be on the larger side. Um, But we are seeing more and more data privacy um, as that is becoming central, especially in Europe. And with respect to the antitrust portfolio in particular, you know, has there been any shift in the types of claims? This is all private litigation, I assume. You know, any trends that you see either with respect to the types of cases or the parties involved? And I don't know to what extent you can identify specific cases as examples, but I'll let you answer the question however you see fit. Sure. So... Our antitrust portfolio is broadly diversified across both geographies and industries. And you'll hear that, you'll hear me say that about our entire portfolio, but in particular with antitrust, uh, because those cases are so large and so expensive and so long in duration that it's important to be well diversified. They do span industries. We also see a fair bit of follow on litigation. Obviously, as your listeners know, in certain jurisdictions, a finding by a regulatory body of, of any competitive conduct can be binding on the defendant company. And so there's only damages to prove. And so we see a lot of that going on in Europe and, and we are quite involved in those. Those are opt-in, opt-in jurisdictions. And so we're, we're quite involved in helping organizations build books for those cases. In the U.S., you know, there are some very large antitrust cases that have been going on for a long time. We are public in at least one of them not intentionally, but but as it is in the proteins cases, you know, those are opportunities oftentimes for litigants who have large damages to opt out of those cases and, and, and sometimes in, in some circumstances to monetize or accelerate the value of those claims early on. And that's, we, we do a fair bit of business there. Companies today don't want to wait years and years to recognize the value of their claims. And so we can step in and monetize those early if we have conviction in those claims. And we do a fair bit of that business today. And in developing the conviction that a claim is meritorious and potentially very, very valuable, to what extent have you used your own antitrust background and experience in your current role, either perhaps when you're starting out or or now? I think what drew me to antitrust in the first place was a certain curiosity beyond the, the specific issues in a dispute and sort of the larger market dynamics that were playing out within a dispute. Um, so unlike an average business dispute with antitrust law, you really need to understand the market in which the companies that are litigating are operating in. Whether it's the product market or the ge- geographic market, those, those are actually critical to the claim. You can't just focus on the language of a contract to get to resolution. And I, you know, I think that that has served me well at Burford. What I do, in addition to sort of running the the investment function, I spend a lot of my time thinking about where litigation is going, what industries are going to be fertile ground for legal finance. So I'm looking at what's going on in different industries, where regulations are going, what are the unique pressures that companies are dealing with in certain industries. And many of those same inquiries require a really deep understanding of, you know, whatever marketplace we're looking at. I'm always happy to jump back into an antitrust case. And if I can pick up a motion to dismiss decision and, and get my sort of hands into it or, or read the expert work on, you know, on a case that we're looking at investing, that's tons of fun, but I don't, I don't often get to do that anymore. It's, you know, part, part of the job that I have now is just is, is running the function and not digging into the cases as much, but it is always fun to get back to my antitrust roots. 
Matthew and I both um, relate to that curiosity and fascination with learning about new businesses, industries. Um, so I'm glad to still, uh, you know, have a little bit of that experience. Absolutely. Aviva, it'd be interesting to compare, I think, for our listeners, the overall scene as it was when you started at Burford in, in 2010, having it was founded, I think, shortly before that, as it is today. Certainly sitting here in the UK, it's exploded over that period. It'd be interesting to get your take on, on that change. So when I joined Burford, the first question I got and it's frankly the first question that I asked when Chris Bogart, our CEO, called me is, what is it? <laughs> right? That was the first question. What is it? And, and why would anybody do it? I am happy to say I think we're past you know, the early adopter stage. Most lawyers have now heard of it. And they have some sense of what it is. If they don't truly understand the nuances, they at least have heard of it. I think back then, the perception was that it was something that was used by litigants who couldn't afford their lawyers of choice. And it probably came with some bit of ick factor. You know, it's, it's, it's not something that we would use, you know, whoever we is. I think happily, that notion is also in the rearview mirror. Today, I guess I think about maybe three ways to think about it. Today, smart litigators see it as their responsibility to educate themselves about legal finance and how it might serve their clients. Even if they're not using it for a particular case, they come off as being advisors to clients and not just litigators on a case, and that's really important. I hear from managing partners at Big Law pretty regularly, hey, we're behind the curve. Can you come teach us? You know, we don't know that we need it, but, but we want you to come teach us. So I think that's a, that's a really positive development. I think companies are more keen, more than ever keen, to manage, you know, increasing costs of litigation. And so they're looking to legal finance as a smart way to finance litigation. Uh, they may have the internal resources to do it, but they're now thinking of it as sort of, you know, what I'll call uh, corporate finance for law. It's really just part of the capital stack. So we are talking today to CFOs as often as we're talking to GCs. And I think that's a very significant development. And then I, I guess from a career perspective, it used to be that if you were a refugee from big law, as a litigator, a natural place to go was either a smaller firm or in-house, right? Those were like your options. I'm happy to say our last commercial underwriter hire was a senior associate from Wachtell who sought us out. And our most recent case manager, we just hired a guy who spent the last decade doing case managing you know, in-house at Apple, and so, you know, that tells me that legal finance as a career has certainly arrived. And I think that's a big change and, and a real opportunity for a lot of litigators who, you know, who are ready to make a move. You know, that's an interesting development. And I think it seems to me that as a private practice advisor who's doing a proper job, ethically, you really need to be aware of this and advise your client of that option. Otherwise, you're not properly advising yeah, I think, I think in-house lawyers feel the same way. I think that's certainly true of, of outside lawyers. And I think in-house lawyers feel it's their obligation to bring the opportunity to their CFOs and say, these are other ways that we can finance litigation and, and ways that we can turn an in-house department, which is always thought of as a cost center, into an affirmative revenue stream by, by accelerating opportunities to accelerate or monetize claims before they come due. You know, I think I think both in-house and outside lawyers are are sort of at this point it's incumbent upon them to understand how this works and whether or not it can benefit their clients. Yes, you have a global role at Burford, but are sitting in the U.S. now. But you've seen U.S. and non-U.S. cases and developments. Could you talk to us about some of the major differences between what you what you see and deal with in the U.S. and some of the key non-US jurisdictions? I think the biggest differences are probably the types of litigation. And I don't mean by, by type of claim, but really by size and cost. I mean, the US has the largest damages cases in the world, right? And so that is fertile ground for legal finance because those cases are by their nature expensive and take, take a long time. So I think there aren't as many large cases, for example, 
going through the UK high courts as there are going through the Southern District of New York. And so we're going to see more opportunity at scale in those larger jurisdictions. Cost of litigation is a big factor. Obviously, I'll use the UK again, cost litigation, very high. You've got a loser pays jurisdiction. And so you've got to deal with ATE as well. And that means that there's more opportunity, I think, for a legal finance provider to, you know, to provide financing because of the expense of litigation in that, in that respect. You look at other jurisdictions where the cost of litigation is just lower, Spain, Italy, and, and similarly, the, the value of those litigations is also just smaller. And so there's not as much opportunity. There is opportunity for smaller funders, not so much for Burford. The types of cases that we see across, across jurisdictions are actually pretty similar. You know, run the gamut again of business to business disputes. Probably the biggest differentiator, I'd say, among jurisdictions is that innovative cultures tend to be more open to legal finance. Now, whether that's the court's or regulatory bodies that are more innovative, or whether that's clients, corporates who are more innovative, that's, the, that's I think, one of the biggest drivers of the growth of legal finance is how innovative the culture is. You know, this is something new. It's a little different. It's a little, you know, it, it, it requires a different way of thinking about a legal claim as an asset that can be financed. And that takes a little bit of entrepreneurship, a little bit of innovation to get over that hump. So I think probably the cultural differences are driving differences in growth across jurisdictions as much as anything else. So outside the US, I mean, I mean I'm aware of the UK is, of, of course, has quite a lot of adoption. I know we see it in the Netherlands, at least. So how would you list the top two, three, four jurisdictions in terms of your innovation concept stroke take up of this outside the US? I think Germany is up there. Um, It's been slow, but it's actually picking up quite a bit. And I think part of that is they're learning to be innovative, but part of it is also the size of cases and, and that are attracted to the German markets. I think we're seeing real growth coming out of Asia. That's small at this point relative to the size of the U.S. business, but it is a growing part of our business. Real demand coming from India, South Korea, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong. Those are by and large arbitrations and they're attracted to certain arbitral centers. We're also seeing tremendous growth in the UAE. Burford opened an office in Dubai, I think it's two years ago now. And there's an awful lot of opportunity for growth there. Again, size of size of cases, attractiveness of the legal frameworks and arbitral centers in those jurisdictions means that large cases are coming to be adjudicated in those jurisdictions. As you mentioned, we're probably in the transition during which many practitioners of a certain age will say are getting over what you called the ick factor. Litigation finance is here to stay, for sure. Looking ahead, you you just described some of the opportunities around the world, but what do you think will be some of the big challenges facing the industry itself or Burford or you personally? I'd say the biggest challenge, and it's, you know, I think of it as, as an opportunity, but it's also a challenge, is really the ability to educate what is an enormous market. This is not selling widgets. You know, it's a nuanced, it's, you know, think of it like investment banking for law. So every deal we do and every way, you know, is really quite bespoke. We're looking at clients' needs and trying to come up with structures that address those needs and, and no client's needs are identical. And so, you know, it's easy to get the brand name out. It is hard to educate about how this actually works on a mass basis. And so I think education at the end of the day is our, you know, is our greatest challenge is is how quickly we can get to, to new jurisdictions and, and educate the market about what is a fairly sophisticated financing tool. I think in terms of growth generally in the market, Burford is the only U.S. publicly traded legal finance provider, you know, specialty provider. Most of our competitors operate with private funds. That is a very challenging structure given this is a very long duration asset. So that means that many of our earlier competitors have had challenges in raising new new funds and sustaining old funds for the length of time that it takes for these portfolios of cases to ultimately resolve. Scale here is critical, so that's a, a pretty high barrier to entry. 
So at the end of the day, while I think we at Burford would like to see many, many, many strong competitors, it is a challenge in the market not to have that. It's a little bit of an obstacle to growth when you don't have as many significant at-scale competitors. And then I guess lastly, there's always the possibility of new regulations that would have some impact on on legal finance in any jurisdiction. And I say this with you know fingers and toes crossed. I, I think that the trend on that issue is headed in the right direction. You know, for example, we Burford spent an awful lot of time over many years educating the market in Singapore about the value of legal finance for clients, for um, businesses that want to go there as an as a center for arbitration. Ultimately, that jurisdiction opened up to legal finance for certain types of claims, but that takes many years of education. As I say, it's a it's a long play on the education side. Similarly, in the U.S., you know, we're always have our eye open on what's going on in, in legislative bodies. But I think most regulatory bodies are looking at this and understanding that the market wants this. There are, of course, the annual discussions about disclosure, and many courts are moving in that direction. I think Burford's position on that is we don't mind disclosing as long as it doesn't derail cases. If it doesn't turn into a a frolic and detour about discovery, at some point it will become the norm. In, In treaty arbitration, it already is the norm. Disclosure is the norm to the arbitral body and, and to the other side. And it's it's something akin to disclosing insurance. It's sort of a nothing burger. And then we move on with the case. So I think that's where we're heading on that particular issue. But certainly regulation is always you know, something that we're, that we're watching for. Aviva, you mentioned opportunities in jurisdictions around the world that you've seen and are focusing on. Maybe looking in particular at areas that might be relevant to the section of antitrust law, what types of claims do you see developing over the next few years? And one obvious one, it seems to me, could be climate change stroke ESG or greenwashing type claims for consumers. Is that an example or are there other examples as well of claim areas that might be interesting to look at? Sure. I think those are interesting. Whether they are, you know, whether climate change litigation is fundable is a question to me. It it may very well be, but I'm not sure that that's sufficiently developed for me to have a view on it just yet today. As you mentioned earlier in the segment, I think data privacy is becoming a massive issue. From the antitrust perspective, you know, I think you're going to see in the U.S. continued, oh, I suppose it depends on the administration, but you're going to see continued strong enforcement. And so you're going to see, you know, a fair bit of private, you know, private litigation that follows. If I had to pick an industry where I think that's going to be really significant, it's probably healthcare. The U.S. healthcare system is is so very broken. And I think there is a, a fair bit, and I'm saying this with sort of as, a, as an outsider and someone who just reads the newspaper, a fair bit of bad conduct going on. And I suspect a fair bit of antitrust, antitrust litigation to come on that on that front, and then I think, of course, the last space and probably the biggest is in tech. We're obviously seeing it with Google, Apple, Facebook, and I think there's going to be a fair bit of that, and that is going to go on for you know decades, I'm sure. Having spent almost a decade at Time Warner, you know the the challenge with antitrust and technology is that technology tends to move faster than the law, but that doesn't stop regulators and and private litigants from from bringing those cases. So I think those are going to be very central over the next decade or so. And I hesitate to say AI because we're so at the front end of it, but I suspect that that, that will be part of part of the landscape as well on the antitrust front. Well, it's something to look forward to. The more litigation, the better as far as you're concerned, right? You know, it's sort of a perverse thing, but yeah, but yes, more litigation is better for Burford. I don't know if it's better for the economy and the world, but it but it is better for Burford. Switching gears, I did want to make sure that our listeners heard about something else that you've been involved in and that that you were a, a starter of, and that is the Equity Project. Can you tell us what that is? Yes, and thank you for asking about it. So the Equity Project is a project that we launched in 2018 after doing a little bit of data work. We at Burford are data hounds. We use data to learn and analyze and grow. 
And we just did a simple project where I said to one of my one of my team, I said, tell me who's bringing us cases. Tell me who, what kinds of cases we're seeing. And this goes back over, you know, maybe five or six years worth of data. And what I found was pretty astonishing because what I realized was we weren't seeing cases coming from women litigators. And I was sort of flabbergasted because I'd never thought about it before. And once I did, it was, it was very stark. And that was sort of the impetus for the equity project, which is a $150 million so far, $150 million pool of capital that's been committed to fund litigation that is run by women. The first phase was $100 million to support women litigators, and it was expanded in phase two to $150 million and to expand the pool to racially diverse lawyers as well. And the idea is that that pool of litigators are often not the ones who are handed clients you know, in the in, in big law. They don't necessarily follow in the footsteps of, you know, getting clients handed to them by their senior partners for a whole variety of reasons, which we won't go into here. And this was a way to say, we actually think that those folks are, you know, often as good or better than their, than their counterparts at big law, but they're not getting that chance. So we're going to put our money where our mouth is and say, we're actually we're actually taking risk on those on those lawyers. So you law firm should also be willing to take risk on them because we believe in them and we're going to help them build that book of business in part so that they can they can develop their careers. But but with a larger a larger idea in mind, which is to say that when when you're a rainmaker at a law firm, you have power at a law firm. And when you have power to law firm and you're sitting in the executive suite, that's when you can change the culture of a law firm. So there's a sort of lofty idea here that if we if we raise up women and people of color into positions of power within law firms, they will have a better shot at changing those cultures that I think need changing. And law firms, I think, are in agreement, want to change the culture and just ha- that change has been very slow. So we've tried to inject an economic reason for law firms to do the right thing. And I'm happy to say that it's been enormously successful. And we are come Knockwood, come September, about to launch phase three, which will be doubling down on that thesis. The I guess the other piece that's worth mentioning is if a corporate takes our funding through the equity project and uses it with a female or racially diverse lawyer running their case, we not only fund that case, but Burford will take a piece of its profits, a portion of its profits, and pay it forward to a nonprofit that is promoting women and racially diverse lawyers in law, because I really do believe that that's part of our obligation is to pay it forward. Well, that really is putting your money where your mouth is. So very good. That's an exciting project. And it will be exciting to see women and racially diverse lawyers leading these big, big cases and winning the big, big judgments that help keep you in business. Now, turning to the final segment of our show, it's been a wonderful conversation. I wish we could talk more, but got to end it at some point. So let's find out something a little bit different. We ask all of our guests this question, what is something interesting about yourself that is completely outside of your professional endeavors? I ask this of of interviewees when I'm interviewing them because I think it says something about who they are. So I'll share my answer to my to, to the way I think about it. What what alternative career would you have gone into if not if not a lawyer? And for me, and it shares it's it's a, an interest of mine. I would have either been a neuroscientist if I had made it as one, or a gardener. Um, and I am a passionate gardener, and I. <laughs> I don't know why I think those two things go together, but to me they do. Um, the idea of of understanding what, how something is impacted by something else and how it grows and, and adapts to different environments, I find that fascinating. I already started on a second career as a gardener. I, I love gardening, and I and I make a, a really good mint ice cream from the mint in my garden. I don't know how interesting that is, but you're you're invited any time for my mint ice cream. Well, thank you. I know mint mint has a tendency to take over, though, so I'm sure you'll have a bumper crop before you know it. <laughs> now, the other thing we're going to do before we let you go is to play a little game we call The Curious Hat. And now it's time for The Curious Hat! The rules are very simple. 
I'll ask Matthew to draw a random surprise question from our virtual hat. So take it away, Matthew. Thanks, Alicia. I'm now drawing the random question from the virtual hat. And Aviva, the question is, what book are you reading right now? And what do you think of it? That is a good question. I am reading the newest short stories from Amor Towles. And I, what do I think of it? I am enjoying it. I'm not a short story reader, typically. And I've, I've decided to try doing that because I think it's either that or I'm, I'm reading New Yorker articles because reading novels in June when Burford is closing its half just is just an impossibility. So I'm thoroughly enjoying the short story model and I think, I think it might carry me through the summer. Oh, I love short stories too. So I think it's good you're, you're jumping on that trend. Thank you, Aviva. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you to all of our listeners. It's been a wonderful conversation. Tune in for the next Our Curious Amalgam. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam, a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust Section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at at ourcuriousamalgam.com. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcasts, podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.